the most enduring elements in media is the catchphrase. From a single sentence to a single word, it immediately evokes a character or a show in a way that's instantly recognizable. But in modern day media, it seems the catchphrase has fallen out of fashion. It used to be everywhere, but now it's either seen as too forced or too cringe, especially in comedy. And the ones we do have will only continue to dwindle with age. So what happened to the catchphrase? How is it used to complement character, used to make us laugh, and used to make us buy things? But first we need the truth. Where do catchphrases come from? Many catchphrases are rooted in some kind of truth, an expression of something common, but also sincere. I'm listening. Some of the earliest examples of a catchphrase can be found in radio. Rob Wilton's The Day War Broke Out, Arvaraski's I Thank You. Uh, I know. <laughs> but one of the very first radio catchphrases was Sandy Powell. In 1933, he was doing a live recording on the radio of his comedy record, Sandy at the North Pole. He asks to be put through to his mother, the joke being that his mother would be found at the pub. Tell her to leave her bread and milk and come and listen to her son Sandy speaking from the North Pole. Can you hear me, mother? It was basically an ordinary line in a sketch which got repeated several times after some jokes. Talk about cold. <laughs> well, you've all heard the old saying about it being cold enough to freeze the... Can you hear me, mother? The story goes is that during the recording, Sandy Powell dropped his script, and this was live radio, so to fill the air, he repeated, Can you hear me, mother, several more times. This then led to the phrase being repeated by audiences, so the next day, the theatre manager told him to say it again, and it stuck with him throughout his career. There's one little thing I would like to say before I leave you. Can you hear me, mother? He says, it just goes to show that you can't kid the people. They pick what they fancy, no matter how you try and push them. With the boom of television sets entering American homes in the 1950s, this led to what was originally called the Golden Age of TV, such as The Honeymooners. In response to The Bickersons, a show about a feuding married couple, Jackie Gleason wanted to do a more realistic portrayal of a feuding married couple, initially as sketches before becoming a short-lived TV sitcom. And it gave rise to... Bang, Zoom! <laughs> You're going to the moon! And... Pow! Right in the chest! It's obvious this is not meant to be taken seriously, but it can be hard to ignore the comparisons to domestic violence, especially for women in an era when it wasn't taken seriously, further trivialized by comedy catchphrases. And he was just using space travel as a metaphor for beating his wife. Audrey Meadows, who played Alice, the on-screen wife, acknowledges with the increased openness and awareness of abuse, this would probably be unpalatable to a modern-day audience, but said this was meant to be just letting off steam and that there was no violence. So, a not really threatening threat between couples, since even the most loving couples do argue sometimes, which made it an ugly but more honest portrayal than its squeaky clean counterparts. 60s British sitcom Steptoe and Son served as the inspiration for its US remake, Sanford and Son. You hear that, Elizabeth? <laughs> I'm coming to join you, honey. Steptoe and Son stood out against the light-hearted, farcical and slapstick nature of comedy in the 60s and 70s to also present an ugly but honest looking show, holding up a mirror to the social realism of the lower class, represented by the rag and bone men which is also reflected in their usage of slang, which became synonymous with the characters. Uh, you dirty old man. Such as a load of old cobblers, which the show helped massively popularize. How you talk a lot of old cobblers at times. <laughs> and this idea of slang becoming a catchphrase, because it not only represents a character, but also a culture, is found throughout media. Hey, lovely, jubbly. What are you talking about, Willis? I'm a puppet. Go on, when it's character affirming and sincere, a catchphrase can start to become someone's trademark or their signature. I'll be back. Even families and friends can share their own personal catchphrases that just evolve out of nothing, in jokes that will probably make no sense to anyone else, but it makes you feel like you're a special part of the group. Whenever a cat rolls onto its back, for years my family would call it the wah wah wah, just because of this one advert for cat food. Wah 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 wah. A catchphrase can become emblematic of the show, the character, or even just a feeling because it's based on something true, rooted in being relatable and real. And that's why we quote them when we find ourselves in a similar situation. And I do this too. Such as... But first, a word from our sponsor.
This video is sponsored by Keeps. Speaking of somebody whose hair is retreating so fast it's like it's running away from my nose. Don't make me angry. That scares me. Hair loss can be intimidating. Just see how hair loss affected my dad. Tragic. Keeps is a subscription service for hair loss prevention and treatment. Shipped and delivered to your home. It's FDA approved to help keep it affordable so you won't be paying through the nose. Say hello to my little friend. I don't want to. You can get treated from your own home. Online consultations with a licensed doctor who is available 24-7 to help recommend a hair loss treatment plan and to track your progress to prevent hair loss before it takes a nosedive. Do you feel lucky, punk? Um... It's from Dirty Harry. Oh, sorry. I haven't seen that one. Head on over to keeps.com slash NA to get 50% off your first hair loss treatment plan. Hair loss stops with Keeps. So give them a try, because who knows? Where's my nose? You'll never take our freedom. Also, I cut off your nose. <laughs> Thanks, Keeps, and back to the video. Catchphrases complement comedy, and so it can take on many forms. An intro. What's up, Dad? An outro. So it's good night from me, and it's good night from him. The setup. During the war, a crewmate of mine, Sky Piggott, died of a sexually related condition. His girlfriend's husband shot him. <laughs> or the punchline. And I was rummaging around in the attic, and I found the original copy of the Bible. <laughs> Which was nice. These can also be used as some kind of exclamation. No! Or proclamation. Are you idiot? But it serves the same purpose of saying, and that's the joke, like an alternative version of the musical Sting. In comedy, these serve the purpose of being a running gag. Who loves orange soda? Such as South Park. In practically every episode of the early seasons, the character Kenny would die in some overly horrific way, and the characters would respond with, Oh my god! They killed Kenny! You bastard! And then he would return in the next episode like nothing happened. The cartoon violence was entertaining, but Trey Parker and Matt Stone grew sick of trying to force Kenny's obligatory death in every episode, finding it to be such a chore. Dude. And being basically a walking, muffled prop, there was little else they could do with the character. The joke had run its course. In season 5, Kenny permanently died, which gave room for other characters like Butters a chance to shine. Kenny returned in classic alive form at the end of season 6. Oh, hey, Kenny. Dude, where have you been? And ever since, his deaths have become much less frequent. But when they do happen... And that got us thinking. Oh my god, they killed Kenny. Catchphrases as running gags became staples in British sketch shows. Little Britain, Goodness Gracious Me, The League of Gentlemen, and it massively aided their popularity. In 1998, there was the comedy show Friday Night Live, not to be confused with Saturday Night Live, although they did originally air on Saturdays, so it is confusing. Featuring appearances from Ben Elton, Fry and Laurie, and the Dangerous Brothers. Look, it's my video. If I can mention Rick Mail, I will. What a charming, smashing blouse you have on. Anyway, this is where a legend in the sketch show scene, Harry Enfield, debuted his character, Loads of Money. I stick it in the slot, right? His sign comes up. How much money do you require? Yeah! <laughs> a plasterer who was purposely obnoxious about his earnings. He was made to be a commentary on the Thatcher government, and even Thatcher herself brings it up. The catchphrase got so huge it was turned into a song and peaked at number four in the charts. Whop it out. Whop it out. I didn't say it was good. <laughs> the character was a huge hit, but Harry Enfield became concerned that the political satire element was being lost as people were turning him into a hero. So on Red Nose Day 1989, he officially killed off the character and would replace him with a more unambiguous caricature of the Conservatives. Work shite, scroungers, lay about, vote Conservatives! I shall have my milky bar now, please, mother! Harry Enfield's regular co-star Paul Whitehouse would go on to co-create The Far Show. During a press event for Harry Enfield and Chums, a press tape of the show was put together with just the fast cut highlights. This inspired Whitehouse and co-creator Charlie Hickson to assemble a show that would be just the highlights. Rapid fire sketches like some kind of fast show. With the sketches being boiled down to just their essentials, it allowed for a huge plethora of catchphrases. Hi, I'm Ed Winchester. Yeah, it's in me. Right. Jumpers for goalposts. Got you. Suit you, sir. Whoa, a little bit way, a bit brilliant. <laughs> I have been mostly eating cheesy peas. Nice. But what helped them be so endeared was often how grounded they were. Either something relatable. <laughs> Does my bum look big in this? Or something you might overhear from the bloke in the pub. Um, don't even fancy a pint. 
being so fast paced, it might have been difficult to have the characters be any more than two dimensional talk boxes who just say the line and leave the stage. How can they show any depth? by weaponizing their catchphrases. Roly Birkin QC tells mostly unintelligible stories interspersed with the occasional coherent word or phrase. Cairo. <laughs> but always ending on the phrase, uh, I'm afraid I was very drunk. But in one of these speeches, the tone suddenly changes. I held her in my arms. I'm afraid I was very drunk. It's the same catchphrase, but this time it carries a sense of grief, regret, and sorrow. It's surprisingly very touching and goes to show the power that the catchphrase can have, not just as a comedic device, but something that defines and redefines a character. Anything could become a catchphrase, but its success is entirely up to the audience. In I Love Lucy, Lucy's husband, Ricky, has his famous catchphrase, Lucy, you got some splaining to do. No, he didn't. How what? Ricky Ricardo never said that line. But it's in Rocco's Modern Life. Lucy, you got some splaining to do. And Grey's Anatomy. Lucy, you got some splaining to do. And Matthew Perry said it, and he wouldn't lie. Lucy, you got some splaining to do. Yeah, I know that's what people say, but he didn't say it. Laron Reedus, in the words of Ricky Ricardo, the fuck is this? <sighs> Look, as catchphrases are controlled by the consensus of the audience, sometimes the catchphrase is not even an actual quote. Darth Vader doesn't say, Luke, I am your father. He says, No, I am your father. Casablanca never had Play It Again Sam, but Play It Sam. Beam me up, Scotty, was never said in the original Star Trek series, despite some near misses. Beam me up. Scotty, beam us up fast. Beam us up, Scotty. Lucy, you got some splaining to do, is one of the show's most quoted lines, but this is a Mandela effect. Usually when Lucy winds up in some trouble, Ricky would want her to splain what's going on, but never use that phrase. The closest the show got to this line is from Lucy herself. Oh, Amber, would you excuse us? I have a little explaining to do to Ricky. You sure have, dear. It's widely thought to be a mistake made by a journalist toward the end of the series. Once audiences turned the misquote into the show's catchphrase, nothing could stop it. This is because audiences have the power to collectively assign a catchphrase to a character, whether it's right or wrong. Just like my wife. Oh, what? Borat came from Da Ali G's show, but gained international recognition thanks to the first Borat film and its many catchphrases. Very nice. Yet your match. Whoa, whoa, whoa. But when quoting Borat, people usually turn to... My wife! <laughs> <laughs> to the point where you could just say Borat voice and the brain would do the rest. In the first Borat movie, he says my wife nine times. My wife, my wife, my wife, my wife, and my wife is dead. But for the most part, it doesn't sound like the catchphrase. He says my new wife twice and my beautiful wife. My new wife, my new wife, my beautiful wife. Which are pretty close. But he finally says, I had come to make Pamela Anderson's my wife. This appears to be the origin of the shorthand impression of Borat and in turn, a catchphrase. In fact, in Borat's subsequent movie film, possibly just to get the obvious stuff out the way, he practically front loads the film with all the catchphrases. My wife is nice. Not. Like it's an obligation to the audience and then just moves on with the film, downplaying the catchphrases with only a couple more wife mentions. And make sexy time with my wife. Will you be my new black wife? Which shows how a catchphrase's popularity can have an effect on the media itself. Right, like how you keep bringing up how does cat dog poop means you're probably going to have to actually make that video. Um, smoke bomb! 90s British sitcom One Foot in the Grave has the grumpy Victor Meldrew wind up in a series of completely unlikely scenarios. Victor's reaction to these moments is naturally... I don't believe it! Given this is a reaction to something funny coupled with Richard Wilson's memorable delivery, this cemented its place as a beloved catchphrase. I do not believe it! But once the line started to get popular, the show itself changed. They started to reduce the catchphrase rather than say the whole thing. You can merely tease the line and it would still elicit a laugh.
in an episode in its last season, there's a kind of self-examining meta episode where, unbeknownst to Victor, a play about their lives is being performed, and it highlights these seemingly random things that happen to them, but despite the laughter from the audience, the stage manager shuts it down for being too irrational and far-fetched. Or as he says, I don't believe it. The catchphrase has come full circle to influence the source material it came from. Rick and Morty introduced the catchphrase, a derivative of the Free Stooges expression. As Justin Roiland explains, the line was intentionally dumb, a counterculture response to catchphrases to make fun of them. <laughs> That's my catchphrase, remember? This was further subverted to actually translate to, I am in great pain. Please help me. But despite the layers of irony, Wubba Lubba Dub Dub persists unironically. Which is ironic. So even when the show tries to control the narrative of the catchphrase, ultimately, the audience still decides. Wubba Lubba Dub Dub! But an audience is just people, and people can be manipulated. Catchphrases and their byproduct popularity can lead to typecasting, where the public eye forces you to perform in certain roles. Star Trek actors regularly face typecasting, Jonathan Frakes saying it is better to be typecast than to not be cast at all. Many of them have come to accept and embrace the impact they have on fans, including their catchphrase. So as much as a catchphrase can hold a career back, it can also give it back. In the 90s, after Rick James kidnapped a woman during a cocaine fueled binge and went on bail for that incident, kidnapped two more women, his music career kind of took a hit. Until in 2004, when a comedy sketch popularized the catchphrase, I'm Rick James, bitch! Leading to renewed interest in his music and a brief career revival. I'm Rick James, bitch! Before dying that same year. Did I forget to mention anyone in that section? Nope. Good, moving on. So a catchphrase has the power to control the spotlight, even if you're not the star. Somewhere else in the 90s, Family Matters has the character Steve Urkel turn up for what is only meant to be a one-off role. However, he proved to be so popular with audiences, along with his memorable catchphrases, Then I do that. <laughs> that he got promoted to a main character, which initially ruffled the feathers of his co-stars, but the move proved to be a huge success for the show. This contrasts with Good Times, where the catchphrase, <laughs> made JJ into a breakout star. So the series shifted to include them even more, which clashed with the show's premise and co-stars, and all this studio meddling eventually led to a decline of ratings and the show's eventual cancellation. Likewise, studio meddling can create a catchphrase artificially. Yowza, yowza, bobowza! Obviously, there's nothing wrong with inventing a catchphrase to be a catchphrase. Homer's dough comes from Laurel and Hardy. Oh. And Fred Flintstone's Yabba Dabba Doo comes from the voice actor's mother saying, a little dabba do ya. These are seemingly random sounding, but they feel appropriately in character, which helps maintain their longevity in pop culture. But if you're in a rush, the trick to instantly create a catchphrase is to take a line of dialogue. I like trains. Repeat it three times. I like trains. I like trains. And boom, you've got yourself a t-shirt. Don't fucking tell them! In the Big Bang Theory Season 2 finale, after delivering a prank, Sheldon says, Bazinga. It is then repeated two more times, Bazinga. Bazinga. And boom, a catchphrase is born. And it's been trademarked, even though they weren't the first to say it, Bazinga. And slapped onto merchandise. And so has every other catchphrase. Which is understandable, as catchphrases share a lot of DNA with commercial slogans. I'm loving it. Timples. Hey, where's the meat? This is where catchphrases can clash with audiences. When it loses that sincerity and becomes oversaturated through marketing, it feels cheap. When a character gets a big laugh solely for saying a catchphrase, it can feel unearned, because without substance, it's just say the line, Bart. I am the only gay in the village. Yeah! And maybe after having this for so long, nobody wants catchphrases anymore. So there's a sense that audiences nowadays are just tired of catchphrases because when they're not commercialized, they're politicized. Or like their presence in game shows, it feels formulaic. Survey says! Or like their presence in kids shows, they feel pandering. So let it go. Let it snow, let it go. That's why I'm always saying, bro. Oh, I can't wait for Disney to now try and force not talking about Bruno into future movies. Like, imagine if Luca had come out later. Silencio, Bruno. But other than that, it just feels so old fashioned. In a 2018 Radio Times article, John Plowman, former head of BBC Comedy, said that the main channels want to make sure fire hits, so brand new comedy never gets its chance to develop. 
and this shift means playgrounds and canteens are denied catchphrases. Comedies have moved out of the studio and into these kind of dramas or mockumentaries, so because of this semi-realism, when it comes to landing catchphrases, it's getting increasingly harder. That's what she said! <laughs> And as generations grow up, old catchphrases slowly get forgotten as their cultural relevance fades. Even now, many grandfathered catchphrases can only be made palatable if they're worked in with a hint of self-aware irony. And Hulk. <sighs> Smash. But they're not gone. They've changed into a different beast. Catchphrases are a unified language based on us watching the same TV shows, but because of a huge amount of TV shows, networks, and now streaming services, there's so much stuff to see, it's more difficult for us all to have watched the same thing, and therefore, get the reference. So, what unified language do we have instead? Memes. Oh no! Bing bang! Our table! Bing! Your life. Whether it's your mum posting a minion meme on Facebook or your brother posting Among Us gifts on Discord, memes have become our modern day catchphrases. Uh. They can happen naturally, completely unplanned, or be a total misquote. Yes, but actually no. And they too can get worked back into the source material with mixed results. I'm the juggernaut, bitch! So enjoy your memes before they get completely commercialized. Catchphrases are a surprisingly powerful device and marks a unique relationship between the media and the audience. But why are catchphrases so important? They come with a cathartic emotional attachment, like being the punchline to a joke or the culmination of an awesome action scene, which becomes familiar and comfortable. And then down the line, it becomes warm with nostalgia, representing fond memories of laughing along with family and friends. We'll always need catchphrases in some way because it shows solidarity in social situations. Like the Tower of Babel, it's nice to have a shared language to bring people together. And like we always say here on Edache, and that's the cheese. That, that's, that's not your catchphrase. Your homework assignment for the day. But, but, but that's my catchphrase. Oh, come on, I don't have a catchphrase. Let me just take yours, please. Smoke bomb. So remember when I looked at the Naked Gun trilogy? Three of the best spoof comedies of all time? Well, do they stand as a proper trilogy? Do elements from the first film come back to the last film? Or is it just throwaway jokes? So Laurent and I decide to dig through all the clues and find the truth over on his channel. So check that out. Link in the description. That's all, bro. Shout out to this mum's mega big fan patrons. Ashley Kinder, Drifter Wolf, Biddy Vex, Ashley Bird McCarthy, Rusty Robot, Sloan Schoolcraft, Mo Al Kasemi, Sesune Wave, Nathan Andromeda, Nathan Chawinati, Aaron is Chummy, Tom Lemon Teeth, Brett Halford, Clan Wamsley, Matthew Smith, Jake Pinkerton, Louis Weston, Joel the Gay Noodle Jennings, and Mark Hunter. And if you would like to support me, then please consider doing so on Patreon.